Welcome everyone to the introduction and start of our next study on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Before we um, begin, I'd like to welcome those of you who have uh, recently registered uh, for our class. Just as a word of uh, introduction there, Community Bible Studies vision is transformed lives through the Word of God and we do this by making disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ in our communities through caring, in-depth Bible study available to all. Community Bible study has been around since uh, the early 70s, and what started as one small group has grown into a worldwide movement. Study materials are available in over 70 languages in more than 100 countries, with just under one million participants worldwide. Men, women, and children of all ages coming together each week to study God's Word. Uh, just a suggestion here uh, to get the most out of the study. Answer the study questions a little bit each day. It gets you sort of into a, a rhythm of engaging with the Word on a regular basis. Participate in the weekly discussion during core group meeting time. You know, it's so interesting to listen to uh, everyone's answers and get kind of an idea of their thinking on the various questions that are raised in the study as you share and you learn from each other. And then watch the weekly teaching for some practical applications and fun facts. Uh, read the commentary at the end of each lesson done by Bible scholars to give you more context and explanation. And if you're uh, online with Fisher, you can actually listen to the commentary uh, audio. Community Bible Study is headquartered in Colorado Springs and is not affiliated or connected with any particular church or denomination. Class participants have a wide range of uh, Bible knowledge. Now, if this is your first time uh, to study the Bible, or if you've studied the Bible for years, <laughs> you've made an excellent choice. Congratulations, you've chosen the best Bible study around. Now, if you have any thoughts or questions about community Bible study, don't hesitate to reach out to any of our leaders, and we'll do the best we can to answer uh, your questions. Again, welcome. So a young man is playing golf with a pastor, and at a short hole, the pastor asks, what are you going to use on this hole, son? Well, the young man says, an eight iron. How about you? Well, the pastor says, I'm going to hit a soft seven and pray. Well, the young man hits his eight iron and puts the ball on the green. Well, the pastor tops his seven iron and dribbles the ball out a few yards. Oh, the young man says, Pastor, I don't know about you, but in my church, when we pray, we keep our head down. Now, if you don't get that, um, let me just suggest that you ask a golfer in your uh, little core group. Will you pray with me? <laughs> Speaking of prayer, <laughs> would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we begin the study of your word, guide our hearts and minds so that we can start to grasp the great riches you, we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, uh, here's a quick snapshot on this book of the Bible. According to the introduction to Ephesians found in the New International Version of my Bible, uh, it goes like this. This letter was written by Paul during his two-year imprisonment in Rome during 60 AD. It was probably not sent just to the church of Ephesus, but to all the churches near there. Paul was the pastor there for three years. Timothy and John, the, the writer of uh, the Gospel of John and Revelation, also pastored there. Now, Ephesus was a large, important city at that time, and so it was a natural center for the Christian churches, but it was also the center of pagan worship, of idols, of, and gods of every sort, causing all kinds of problems for Christ's believers. One of the themes, uh, of which there are many in this book, 
um, and they're not limited to these, but is that of unity and God's purpose to bring all things together under one head, Jesus. So Christ and the church, conduct of believers, and the Christian's armor. Well, because of this unity, Paul wrote, all Christians are one family in Jesus, and they should act like it with a life of love toward each other. He illustrates this by addressing human relationships of husband and wife, parent and child, slave and master. And in this letter, Paul writes about the church. You know, it's not a church building in a certain place, but the church that is made up of all believers who have ever lived. We call this the church, internet, um, <laughs> church universal. He compares Christ's relationship to the church, uh, to the body, a building, and a wife. Ken Bao in his introduction says, Paul tells us in Ephesians that every believer is adopted into God's family because in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. In Paul's day, an adopted child was given all the rights and privileges of a natural born one. The Roman judicial system recognized an adopted child as a new person. All their debts and obligations wiped out. As adopted children of God, believers get a fresh start, a new beginning, a totally new life, and the rights to the riches of a glorious inheritance. Well, as a, as a kid, <laughs> um, growing up in North Dakota, uh, I wasn't much of a book reader. I was too busy outside playing with my friends uh, in the neighborhood. But during the summertime when there was no school, my brother and I would be out and about all day. We always came back home from, for lunch and dinner, of course. And other than that, when it started to get dark, we knew uh, it was time to head back home. So such was life back in the day. However, the one book that I do remember reading back then was Robert Louis Stevens, uh, Stevenson's Treasure Island. You know, I was fascinated by the, the pirate map uh, in the front of the book. Uh, and that showed where the gold doubloons and pieces of eight were buried. Adventure on the high seas, pirates buried treasure, it all captured my imagination. So at the age of seven or, or eight, I decided to bury a treasure chest of my own and make a map to its location. I got one of those you know, old metal lunch boxes and uh, put a few coins in it. Oh, we didn't have many of those, by the way. And some Monopoly money and a little flask of water. I have no idea why the flask of water, but it seemed important at the time. But anyway, on Sundays, our family would pile into the station wagon and make the 25 mile trip from Riverdale to Hazen. And we'd have lunch with my grandparents who lived on a small farm. Well, they had a barn and a chicken coop and a vegetable garden. Anyway, my, my brother and I uh, found some shovels and we picked a spot under a tree and dug a deep hole and placed the treasure chest such as it was in the hole and covered it up. Well, the plan was, okay, well then I of course drew a map showing the location of the lunch pail. And then the plan was to come back and then dig it up at a later time. Well, several weeks passed until our next visit to Hazen. And by that time, it had rained and snow soaked the ground pretty good. Well, undaunted, we followed the map. We found the spot under the tree and dug up the treasure box. Well, we were two little kids, muddy from head to toe. But we were beaming <laughs> because we followed the map and followed the buried treasure. We were rich. Okay, so <laughs> as you study this letter written to the believers in Ephesus, get a little muddy too. Do a little digging. Read the passages from Peterson's The Message a couple of times. Think of Ephesians as a treasure map that will lead you to great riches of life-changing truths. 
Paul says we are rich in Christ. So what do you say? Shall we follow the treasure map and dig up the treasure together? Let's get muddy. See you all next week.